glad you all can be with us. Ricky and I have uh, been chatting, and what we thought we would do this morning is give about an hour, and I thought we would take the first 10 minutes or so and just debrief. We've never, we haven't had an opportunity to follow up on our conversation with Senator Kitchell. We then thought we would talk a little bit about our upcoming meeting with the administration that Kendall uh, is working on and Richie wrote to Kendall and we can share a little bit of where we're at with that and what we expect. And then we'll just <clears throat> take the rest of the time and go around and get updates from folks. I think one of the things that, uh, you know, I think some people have been able to do uh, a little bit more than others. Um, I know not all the committees have met as a group, even, you know, my fault. Debbie's done some, has done quite a bit of work for us, but we have yet to chat. Um, and we know since we're talking to the administration <clears throat> on Thursday, we, you know, that will also uh, allow us to have um, an opportunity to figure out where some of the holes might be plugged from some of the uh, holes that we've identified. So long story short, we'll just go around after we talk a little bit about Jane and a little bit about Kendall. Where folks are at, uh, if you've not met, but somebody in your group, it sounds like might have done some work that, you know, we can just talk about, even just say that, you know, you're, when you're planning on getting together to share what you've found and, uh, and maybe there are other things that you feel like you need to do before we hear from the administration later this week. So, so let's kick it off. If anybody wants to have any, uh, sort of response to the conversation with Jane or any questions. I know Richie's also on that committee. Um, oh, dead silence, we love it. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, and of course, uh, Alice is on that committee. I mean, I, I don't know about everyone else, but the big thing that I'm suspect we're all waiting on is whether or not the feds will change these regulations and allow us to actually um, use, you know, 1.25 billion to, you know, fill budgetary gaps. And I don't know, Alice or Richie, if, if there's something that uh, you're all communicating with our federal delegation, or if you're just, if you're in the sort of hold, holding pattern that we all are in and just waiting to to see what happens. So it sounds just it just just one little piece. It sounds like um, you know the administration is continually in touch. Stephanie, that is, with the Treasury, looking at what can be done and can't be done, and then looking at different ways that maybe something can be done. That seems to be what's going on with regard to a lot of the money. I don't know, Richard, yeah. do you have anything to the, add? Um, I, I I think. Um, for us in the, our existing budget, this second bill that they're beginning to fight over that passed the House that, um, that the administration said is dead in the water and whatever, that's the place that there probably is going to be help internally within state budgets. Um, you know, when they get sorted out with that stuff. Uh, but, you know, I'm not one for much for knowing the ins and outs of the fights in Washington. If somebody else has got a better handle on that, um, they're a lot smarter than I am. So one other question I have is, <clears throat> in terms of appropriations, are you all planning on, what's your process, I guess, from here on out? Where are you at? Uh, is it the, like you said, Stephanie's talking with the treasury, uh, the treasurer's office, she, they're helping to determine what can be spent, what can't be spent. And then when would that all, when would we know when that money is distributed? So just maybe I misled you. She's talking with the U.S. Treasury. The U.S. Treasury. Okay. And, and there's a whole group that meets to try and sort things out. So I think one of the places is, of course, they're planning to try and use that money or let's see, I got to think how they're going to do this. They're going to use different money that may be reimbursed if they have to, if they can't use that directly. Okay. Like find a different way to go about it. And yeah. what's, what's the timing, uh, Alice? I mean, for example, a constituent asked me yesterday, 
He said, do you guys think you'll be done, you know, in terms of distributing these funds by the end of June? Or is this something just is going to be ongoing throughout? No, this, uh, uh, you know, it, it, I think you really heard from Jane. Um, we're going to do the budget adjustment. There's a piece of money that's already been spent of the COVID money um, by the administration. You know, in the 65 to $80 million range that they've already spent, that joint fiscal is approved. Mm -hmm. The joint fiscal committee will, uh, um, with the, cons the administration will bring another pot of money that's probably about 150 million to joint fiscal for joint fiscal approval. And then the rest of all of um, the COVID money will be spent in the budget process. And the likelihood is that the bulk of that money will, will be spent in um, this first quarter budget that we're gonna do because we're gonna do a three month budget and then moving to um, the last three quarters. But I expect that the bulk of that that um, COVID money will be spent in that first quarter budget. And for me, what uh, I'm hearing, that's where I think that um, um, this committee is gonna get an opportunity to say, here are the things that we think are um, um, related to a transition period and we should get some ability to um, say what we think needs to happen. I think there'll be areas like higher education um, and what's going on at the state colleges in the university that we'll get some way in. Um, I would like to think broadband. Um, the administration has said they want a third of the money spent on the economy. And I'm not sure what that means, but I think that um, that moves into what we're doing. Um, and I would say to Mark and um, um, the dark Senator <laughs> with no face, you know, he's kind of really black in there. Um, G from the mafia, yes. <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> um, that we're gonna have to get a handle on what they're proposing in that. But it's that, I think the bulk of that COVID money is going to be spent in that first quarter. Rich, when you say spent, do you mean apportioned, but oh, the, ex yeah. the exact use is yet to be determined? Kind yeah, of a, well, a it, or, or it will be budgeted out, I think. As, yeah. as a template for, yep. with further decisions on just how each, the, okay, thank you. Yeah. And I think this to finish the budget adjustment. I'm not sure what days we're meeting yet, but. <laughs> yeah, and I, it's important to, to note, and maybe Joyce was gonna weigh in on this, but the, the funds in the CARES Act have to be spent by December 30th. That's correct. So that, and not, not just budgeted, not just appropriated, but spent. Yeah. And so that's one of the big reasons why they have to go you know, early. And um, I know that both Ledge Council and JFO have been in those treasury meetings trying to figure out creative ways that we can use the funds. I've worked with several of them. Um, so I don't know, Joyce, you want to say more, but. <laughs> sure, that, that's the point I was going to make. Uh, um, there is a, a work group that's working through NCSL and that had a conference call last week with a treasury high up official. And um, it, he was very clear that the funds absolutely have to be spent. It's not enough to obligate them. It's not enough to hand them off to someone who's going to spend them. The, the funds really have to be spent by December 30th. He also emphasized that it, it, those funds are really targeted at COVID related expenses. So if you can make the case, for example, that um, school districts with higher unemployment rates, school districts in counties with higher unemployment rates have larger costs related to something or other, um, then, then you can 
perhaps apportion funds that way, but you have to have something that's directly related to the COVID effects in order to spend those monies. Rich, if mm -hmm. may, the same statements were made in the summer of 2009 with the, the stimulus money that went out. And um, for those of us that are looking at broadband, um, that was all supposed to be spent that year for shovel ready stuff. In the broadband area, the money carried over for I think two or three years and, and the people that had gotten control of that um, didn't, weren't obliged to actually use it for several years. So that's what, this is the same thing we were told in 09 at this time of the year. I, I'd have no, I can't estimate, make any estimates on whether that's gonna be modified or changed. And I think Ms. Manchester is correct. That's what they're saying now. Yeah, I, 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 I understand that. In the appropriations process for us though, we're almost done the budget adjustment. And so the next, um, and the process that was laid out in joint fiscal is, um, you know, 65 to 70 to 80 million. The administration has got to spend, has, we laid out a number and they will spend 150 we laid out for the administration with joint fiscal to spend, but that really leaves the vast majority of that um, um, 1.2 billion um, for um, to be appropriated, to be spent. And the next place to do that is in um, the first quarter budget that we're gonna do. So in June, we'll have to have plans to be able to get that out the door to either either get it all spent or at least obligated, you know, I, I think from the federal position, they're gonna say, you gotta spend this by the end of the year. If you might be absolutely correct, Mark, that if we're on a track, to spend it, they might not claw it back, but we're definitely going to have to have this obligated and down the tube. <laughs> if um, um 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 you know, there's always I think a little flux in there. But for us, June is going to be the time when um um the appropriations committee is going to be put putting that money in a budget to get it out the door. So. So are we, you want to move on, Brian? Brian, you're muted. Uh, yes. Anybody else have any questions or, or Joyce, did you want to say anything else? Okay. So why don't we uh, go ahead and talk a little bit about Kendall, uh, your email to Kendall Ritchie and what we're expecting to hear later this week. So, um, um, we have asked the administration to put together a presentation on um, transition plans, give an overall view of what their plans are during um, the beginning part of this transition. I suggested um, that they better be ready to talk about childcare as, um, as one of the areas first. I'm thinking that, um, that if they wanna spend um, 30% of this um, COVID money or a third of it on um, the economy. What does that mean? Um, and the question is for the rest of you, what are the other things that Brian and I today should convey to Kendall that the areas that besides childcare and the economy that um, we should convey to her that we want information on? I think the hiring freeze is one thing that comes up. Okay. Okay. Ruth? I guess I would like to get a sense from them about 
when they make a decision to open something, and, and I think childcare is kind of the classic example, but uh, there are other things too. They made the decision to do that before they released any guidance. And then when they release the guidance, it's really complicated and, and it just is gonna be really hard for most childcare centers to meet that guidance. Um, and they just didn't provide very much lead time. So I'm concerned that that sets a precedent for schools and colleges and other really complex institutions to reopen because um, they're just not, I know they're eager to reopen and that the numbers show that it's safe to do so, but they ha they're not giving a lot of sectors, a lot of time to meet pretty complicated guidance. Um, so, and the community, I guess the communication is, is not as, as strong as it could be. I think along those lines, uh, I'd like to hear a little bit more about, I'm starting to receive emails about, you know, the lack of requirement for masks. And uh, I think some reasoning so that we can get back to people. Uh, I think for most of us, I don't wanna speak for everybody, but for me, masks seem just like a logical thing to require. And uh, they're out there, people have them. If they don't have them now, they have access to them for the most part, or at a different stage. And uh, it seems to me that it should be something that we would require. So I'd be curious to know their thinking on that if we don't hear by Thursday. So I think I would like to hear more about that. We are getting a lot of letters. Also, a lot of the constitutional people are writing as well. One of the issues, of course, is the courts being closed. So, you know, if you give a citation to someone, it just adds to the big bump at the beginning. Yeah. Um, Okay. Right. Gonna process. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I, um, yeah, I kind of wanted to go back to the child care thing for a minute. Um, we had, on Friday, we had a, a meeting at the Child Poverty Council, and um, uh, Jim is on that uh, too. And we had quite um, a passionate um, testimony from um, a child care provider who was uh, really upset about the June 1st um, uh, opening. Uh, the administration is seeing it as a as a choice, but it's not really a choice because their money, their stabilization funding will stop on June first. So I mean, they really they really don't have a choice. But um, they there there's apparently been a petition drive, and as of Friday, they had over a hundred uh, preschool teachers who already signed it uh, about how upset they are that. Um, they're being forced to reopen with that and they feel it's very inadequate um, uh, precautions uh, being taken and um, inadequate guidance they're given. So I didn't wanna, uh, and we actually have a person from the Department of Health on the Poverty Council. <laughs> he did try to respond um, why that decision had been made that way, but um, I, I do think it bears you know, more investigation and then another couple of things came out of our meeting too. Um, so housing and homelessness, um, I, we have a, that. I think the homeless, I think we have a really big opportunity here to um, house some of these folks that you know we have housed who ha hadn't been housed in a long time, uh, but we've been able to do that. And you know, what are the plan? I think there are they're working on some plans going forward. To continue to. Uh, keep some of these folks, you know, in uh, in housing so that they don't return to, you know, nothing or the streets or camps or couch surfing. But I'd love to hear more about that. And then finally, the um, after programming always seems to kind of dropped. Um, but what was that what was that last bit after school? Oh yeah, for older kids because I mean the assumption seems to be that you know everybody. Only that has young has children only has children like under the age of five, but you know lots of people have you know a four year old and a seven year old and a twelve year old or you know and and the seven and the twelve year olds need after school programming and and also summer programming um, and I think they have a proposal floating around out there too about how to stabilize those programs. So I'd love to hear from the administration what the thinking is about that. But, uh, so, anything from uh, 
your thoughts on health care in particular. You took the first stab at our little health care subcommittee. Anything in particular that you think folks need to hear uh, from the administration on? Yeah, that, well, we've been taking so much testimony in health and welfare. Um, yeah, I, you guys actually, give, <laughs> I would love to get in your brains. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I know sometimes I feel like my brain is full, to be honest. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it sounds like the administration is quite on top of all, you know, the things that need to be done. I mean, you know, like changes to, to, to telehealth and telemedicine to, you know, extend those, um, um, you know, I mean, stabilizing the hospitals is a, and, and independent providers is, is a big challenge, um, you know, working with the insurance companies, but I mean, but a lot of that work is what we're hearing in health and welfare is a lot of that work is taking place. Uh, wouldn't you say, Rich? Yeah, yeah, I would, I would say that that's more ongoing and not as much transition as it is. Right. You know, Anthony had um, had his hand up. Well, I was just going to go back to some of the things we were talking about before. A couple of quick things in terms of child care. It's not just the subsidy program itself, but there's supply issues with health care with, with child care in terms of being able to access kinds of cleaning materials and other supplies that the child care centers are going to need. There's another thing which is <clears throat> sorry which is something we, that's not about money necessarily, but I think there's growing concern about the emotional impact really of sending kids into a situation where like their adults are wearing masks and can't hold them and comfort them, that kind of stuff. I mean, I don't know what we do about that, but I just think it's something we can't forget about that there's gonna be a lot of, you know, sort of trauma, emotional trauma that comes out of reopening too quickly. And I think we have to, so I, again, I don't know what we do about it, but I think we have to be aware that it's, it's real. In terms of healthcare, um, well, two things that are related to healthcare. We've been working a lot on trying to provide funding for EMTs, emergency medical services. And I just wanted to know if the administration is aware of the effort, uh, the fact that EMTs are basically ready to, they're going to go out of business. In terms of, they're talking about ambulance services and emergency medical services. I mean, they're losing tons of money and they're going to really, a lot of them are ready to hit bottom. And it's something that we need to have strengthened as part of the medical system. And it's not, they're not affiliated with hospitals. That's, that's what a lot of us imagine. I used to, growing up, I always thought the ambulance came from the hospital. And therefore, it was part of the hospital, you know, budget and funding, but that's not the case. So I just want to make sure that EMTs, emergency medical services, are on their radar screen as well. And then, and then I would just say food. I mean, as you all know, there have been a lot of people who are relying on emergency food supplies. And this thing the other day, at Berlin Airport, two thousand people, two thousand carloads of people showed up to pick up free food, and you know. How are we going to be able to sustain that? Is there funding and awareness available that people are going to continue to need food? I mean, it's really scary. Um, and people got turned away at the Berlin airport. There were 2,000 cars in, but not everybody made it in. So it's pretty, pretty scary. So the whole issue around food, access to food, is something that we need to continue to work on because there is the possibility that those supplies are not going to last forever. Uh, so if I could just go back. Okay, you go ahead, Rich, and then I just want to go back. No, to I, 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 they, both you and, and, and go ahead, Brian, and then Ruth has got her hand up. I just want to go back. I'm, I'm trying to keep a list here. Yeah, I've, I've got one too, so we can compare. Uh, we, Debbie. Um, so one of the things with health is, and I realize, well, I do think this is connected to the transition. Is if we do transition back to a uh, another wave of uh, people becoming infected. Do you have a sense, uh, or should we put it on the list, do you have a sense from health and welfare if folks, if hospitals are ready for another, if, if we do get hit with, you know, a wave of people becoming infected, you know, in August or in September? Well, yeah, I'm, I, I do get the sense that they're not, they haven't been overwhelmed. Uh, you know, I, I, we haven't heard that really with COVID cases. Um, I mean, more, more than anything, it, it's, uh, 
it really is the financial uh, hit in not being able to do other procedures um, very well. That, that's one of their biggest con concerns. But, um, you know, and then, and then, um, but the things like, you know, like PPE for the, the healthcare providers, I mean, we hear reports all the time. I mean, the investigation will tell us that, I oh, know it's fine and we have enough and, you know, and then the providers on the ground are telling us, no, that's not always the case. So that, that would be a concern uh, if we have a surge. I think. So, so what, I'm not sure. Uh, what? I guess uh, one thing that comes up quite a bit near me is enforcement of the new rules with regard to visitors to the state. And is there any enforcement that's going to occur? This is what people seem to be. They don't mind the people coming if they're, I mean, hard part is thinking that someone's going to quarantine for two weeks before they get here or what's going to happen if, if, you know, they don't. I mean, is it realistic to think that something is going to happen? Well, what, what is it that we're worried about? I, it, it seems to me that the, the Vermonters who choose not to quarantine themselves, which is a small group, um, perhaps are greater numbers, greater percentages of our population than the folks who come here from afar, who come here to and then quarantine themselves because they're worried about where they've left. So what is it we enforce? Uh, so we, the initial yes, one, one group of people we, 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 we seek to enforce that they ought to quarantine on our own citizens, we so, turn so our heads in the other direction. Yeah. So what I'm hearing from people, I mean, we've heard from the administration Vermonters can go to motels, you know, got all those dates set up and that kind of thing. But what the people are writing about are someone who comes and rents the house next door and, the, you know, it's two big families yeah. behind. And I, I think the, it's not very realistic to be thinking that they're going to be quarantined for two weeks before they come. I it's just, I mean, how do you check that? I mean, I, I don't think you do, but that's what... Yeah. It, well, a word that there is enforcement. I don't see what the enforcement is. They're asked if they if they come here By to, to quarantine themselves for the first two weeks when they're here and to stay away from everyone else. That's what the current ask is today. Um, right now. Which is a little challenging for someone who's coming up for the weekend. Yeah. I've gotten emails from people who say, our family wants to visit us for the weekend. Can we do that? And I said, well, since they have to be quarantined for 14 days, the week yes. trip for the weekend doesn't seem to be quite possible. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, they could stay indoors with the family the whole time. Right. Yeah. So, so Ruth was next. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to keep track here. Thank you, Richie. I appreciate it. And can I just request that people unmute themselves too when they're not talking because there's a lot of background noise that makes it hard for people to hear. Um, uh, I just wanted to say that first, the, all the education issues that have been brought up um, are on the list that I sent you that hopefully you all can actually get into this time. Um, Debbie, I just added after school because I had forgotten that, but I, I, I will have to say that if there's no school in the fall, there's not going to be any after school in the fall either. Um, uh, and um, I guess for the meeting that we're having on, is it Thursday, Rich, Thursday. with the administration? I think it's important that we first get a really good overview, sort of big picture overview of their planning for reopening and how they're making decisions. And that's um, that's exactly what we're planning. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you if, because everything that we've had listed for issues was really pretty defined issues, except for your little piece that says before you open up an area, are you going to have guidance that comes out ahead of time? Yeah. Could you put that in the email to Brian and I? Um, yeah. And I would forward that to Kendall as kind of a backdrop to the big picture. I, what yeah. the hope is, is we get the big picture on Thursday. They go somewhat into the areas and then our committees are going to follow up on what gets said. Okay, I just didn't want to get too much in the weeds on a particular issue um, because I feel like we could go down a rabbit hole pretty quickly um, yep. and, and then lose sight of what, what the goal is. Yep. So 
I think that the big picture transition, and, and I don't know who mentioned it, but um, I also think it's important that we hear what their plan is for if there is a resurgent resurgence, if that's the right word, um, because that doesn't seem to be in most of the guidance. They're putting out guidance about how to reopen, but not guidance about what happens if we have to reclose something. What is the guidance there? Just trying to make it a little more orderly um, the next time so people know what to expect. I think that the, the um, <clears throat> excuse me, uncertainty out there is palpable. It's certainly palpable in my house. So I think it's palpable out in the entire state, just what happens if kind of thing. And so the more they can clarify what happens if that, that I think the more helpful it will be. Um, and I'm also, in addition to the masks question, which I'm getting a lot too, I'm getting a lot of questions about contact tracing and how that's actually working. We did have Dr. Levine in to talk to us and that was really helpful, but it, it, it seems to me that they're putting out a lot of information about testing, but not a lot of information about contact tracing. So I just want to get a little bit more clarity on that issue. Like how is it actually working in practice? Okay. Um, so, Give me the email on the um, uh, on that first one, and and um, Brian and I will make sure that that gets passed around, and we'll try to do something broader view. Um, but I am going to lay out um, as many of these issues as I can for them in the background, and tell them they should expect that our individual groups are going to be contacting them up on those issues. Do you want to move into the? areas yeah i think we've hit on some of them uh quite a bit but let's see let's just go back to maybe economic development it seems like we've talked a lot about what we would want to hear from the administration on things like health care education maybe we haven't heard quite as much on what else needs to be uh what questions economic development might have for the administration and our fourth category, um, I'm, I'm blanking on, education, economic development, healthcare, and government. 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 Thank you. So, and we've heard a little bit on, on, any, uh, on governance, but anything else on governance? Or Richard, you want to start by talking a little bit about what you think needs, we need to hear around economic development? Well, we haven't met, but I think um, um, uh, the dark man in, in the center of my screen and Mark and I need to sit down with um, ACCD. If they're going to talk about 30% of all the COVID money going out um, for economic development, I think this week, the three of us are going to have to sit down with them and talk to them about what in broad brush that they might be talking. Um, I think we are gonna um, have to sit down um, with um, 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 Senator Sharotkin um, to where, what's going on in economic development in relation to this. What, what um, do we mean, as, Rich, when we say, what do we mean when we say economic development as a topic? What, what do we mean, what do those words mean? Well, we've got, um, we, I was getting to that. We have the list of suggested areas that we look in. And I was gonna say the, um, um, the things not included on this list that we have in the transition list. I think broadband um, needs to go in the economic development um, pot. I think we heard from Jane that her and, um, um, Senator Cummings, we're going to meet. They're hiring that consultant. I think we need to get in a place where um, we at least understand that and can be back up. My fear is with stuff like broadband is that finance is so busy that you're going to do a lot of it, but you um, they're going to need some help. Um, you know, and as I look down through here, you know, there, there are big issues around the opening of restaurants and, and tourist businesses. Um, I think that that's an area that's particularly, from my point of view, where I'm from, 
going to be particularly hard hit. Um, I don't know if others are hearing it, but um, I'm hearing a lot of people say they're calling former employees and people um, because of child care or any other number of reasons, people are refusing to go back to work. So is there some role that we need to play to make it more advantageous for people to go back to work? And, you know, and, and I would encourage the two of you to look at the list that um, we started to put together and figure out what you consider transition and what not. I think, you know, with Jane's talk about existing programs is it, I think we may be able to start that, but I think that's a longer term discussion if our programs are the right programs to get to some solution. Rich, I, I yep. apologize. I, I, as a committee member, I ask more questions than I constructively answer. And yeah, that's well, you're, you're going to have to come up with some answers. If which you is perhaps why I got assigned to this thing. Yep. And I, when, mm. when we're talking about economic development and we take the subject of broadband and perhaps finance is too busy, um, there, we have two choices as Vermont and Vermonters. We can take money and do short-term stimuluses with old broadband technologies and in the process delay a world-class broadband here in the state of Vermont. And the choices are, do we send the money to um, the technology to be constructed for the future or do we send to the money, the money to people who will send it, not to the technology, but a great number of that, those dollars to their stockholders? And that is a fundamental question that we're looking at. And, and we have to make decisions on what, which of those directions we wanna take. Meanwhile, we sit and listen to um, lobbyists take a lot of our time on Zoom using a lot of words that have no, that are unmeasurable and have no content. And it's like watching an infomercial. How do we deal with this transition committee to see that the money goes to the long-term future, stays here in Vermont and provides an economic benefit rather than it simply puts the money in pockets of people who live out of state and, and provides us with, puts us further away from our goal of, of uh, economic activity. I How do we make those decisions as this committee? How do we recommend? Uh, I think, Mark, that, that this week, um, um, the three of us should sit down with Jane and Ann and talk about, given where they are in hiring a consultant and moving towards a consultant, what our role should be. And, and, I, and, my, yeah. and, and I, think, I think that if we did nothing else on this committee, but answered that question that you just answered, we'd be do we have done our whole job. I, and I, it, I'm, I'm, I'm on that, those same lines again. We keep talking about people and families, and have we categorized Vermonters today in the three basic positions where they work, live, or reside, or or um, quarantine themselves? Because we've got many Vermonters who are working for the same salaries they always work for, that are at home, that have their kids, that whose expenses are less than they used to be, um, are probably cooking for themselves and putting money in the bank. Right. And then we've got Vermonters who are de deemed essential, that we've sent a little money with them to the jobs that they're doing that are dangerous, that um, involve commuting and driving long distances, and can't and have a tough time finding a place to send their kids. And then we have a third group of Vermonters that are out of work, can't pay their bills, um, and are a home and unconnected to anyone, and um, probably were the large part of the people we saw at the airport the other day um, lined up for food. And every time we have to make a solution, is the solution we're coming up with helping the 
the ones that are putting money in the bank, staying at home and doing just fine. The ones that are being told to take their take the, the health and physical risks with their kids on taken care of or the ones that are going to the airport to get free food because those are decisions when we make them we have to make them with those groups in mind instead of which is the easiest or how do we incorporate that thank I, you for giving me this time no I, I i think mark you absolutely bring up one of the questions that the three of us are going to have to struggle with you know, I would say one of the other things about this is um, for economic development, one of the questions that bugs me is I don't think we're asking the question as we're headed to the other side of this in the reopening the economy and the businesses. What's not, what are the areas that um, look like they might not survive and where are the weaknesses that we're going to have? I think that in follows the same kind of thinking that you're talking about. We're helping this group, but not that group. So where are the holes in the, um, in the people that we're helping? But in the same respect, I want to make sure that in the business community, that when I look at it, that the playing field, one area is not so decimated, it because partly because we just aren't paying attention to what we might be losing. But I think yes, that, thank you. Um, Ruth, and then I'm done with economic and, and I'll be calling the other two in our area. Thanks, Rich. I just want to say, Mark, that I really appreciated that those comments about your sort of categories. Uh, you're absolutely right. And I, I had, I think it's important that we remember that the, the different situations people are in and who, who we're actually helping and trying to help. So thank you for laying it out like that. That was helpful. Um, and I just want to put in a plug to say that I, I hope that we define economic development much more broadly than just giving you know, money to manufacturing and businesses. I, I just think that that has a failed economic po development policy in the past. And if we continue to do that, when we have this opportunity to provide funding in a crisis to um, revive our economy, we're just, it's not going to be as broad based and it's not going to help the categories that, that, that we need to hit the most. And the vast majority of Vermonters are employed by small businesses and we need to really make sure that those are front and center. And I, I, I again, want to put a plug in for our organization and nonprofit organizations that, you know, aren't quote unquote, you know, for-profit businesses that we often think about for economic development, but those are crucial organizations to taking care of people, but also for um, uh, just vitalization in our small towns and tourism as well. So just want to make sure we remember those. But the, and, federal, and the federal stimulus seems to have been designed to help the very entities that you just that are not the ones that you've just said we ought to pay attention to. It's, it seems to be designed that way, to send that money to, um, not to the, hey, I'll stop. Okay. Yep. So. Okay, so it sounds, next group. yeah, governance. Um, we've talked a little bit, I think we'll, we'll hear an update from folks on the courts. Um, there might be, you know, they might weigh in a little bit on upcoming elections. Uh, anything else that folks want to say about governance or ha need answers to? Um, Ruth, that's you your area. Alex. Fresh cup of coffee, Ruth. You're ready to go. Um, <laughs> so, anything else on governance that folks have questions that they'd like to hear uh, the administration answer? Yes, yeah, Senator Plina. Well, we've been talking about this a lot in GovOps, obviously, and we've done a lot of um, changes, emergency changes, given the onslaught of the pandemic. And we've talked about whether or not we need to pass legislation, essentially, that would allow the transition to emergency measures to go more smoothly should, this, should there be a resurgence. In other words, we've allowed select boards to meet without a designated location, that kind of stuff, and, or to change the due date for tax or tax um, payments and whatnot. 
we've taken those on individually mostly and said here are some changes we need to make. So we've been talking about whether or not we should put together a package of things that communities are gonna to need to be able to do should there be a resurgence and sort of put that into law so that next time there's a, if this were to happen again, we wouldn't have to pass legislation on each individual issue. We would have something that would be ready to be implemented right away. So we, I mean, I don't, know if, I don't know if it'll turn out that way or not, but that's what we're thinking is that we should have a package that sort of gives community municipalities the ability to transition to a pandemic-like operation without having us to pass legislation on for each individual issue. And that's a great point. I have that written down now. Uh, others, as it relates to governance. Well, I, th I think um, following up with Beth Pierce's bill that's, I don't know if it actually has a bill number or anything yet, her bill that's in the house with regard to loans to municipalities and having the state pay the interest, getting that money out of the COVID money for the interest in fees. So I think I think that's going to be a very important bill for towns and the other municipalities. Not for every one of them, they don't all need it, but there's certainly, I think we heard there were 82 that definitely are going to need something. And I guess the question would be, you know, does the, does the administration see this as a need? I'm sure they do. But. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else? Mm -hmm. So it sounds like, I feel like we've, we've asked questions again of the administration relating to, related to the four uh, subcommittees, economic development, healthcare, um, I think um, Ruth has done a fair amount of work in education. Can you talk a little bit about where um, you are? You and yeah. Anthony? Sure. Yeah. Anthony and I met last Tuesday and we put together a list and then I added to it because I can never resist to add things to lists. Um, so it's, I sent it yesterday and um, the child care, it, it covers child care. Um, K-12 and higher education. And some of the issues are similar for each of them. Um, I think access to PPE and cleaning supplies and testing and tracing, that is true for all of them. Um, and then the financial impact is huge for all of them as well, um, but it, it differs com for each level. Um, uh, I, all of them also mental health and trauma informed practices as I think it was Anthony mentioned. Um, a lot of kids are in a, young and old, are in a different space um, with their mental health at this point, and that is going to have a huge impact when um, schools and child care centers and colleges reopen. Um, obviously, for colleges, people coming back into the state and the procedures for that, um, dorm space and the ability to quarantine and a lot of, you know, things that go along with the residential um, it assists a system um, for the K-12 um, and higher ed to contracts and how um, to meet contractual obligations during this pandemic. Um, obviously for higher ed, the Vermont State College system situation is front and center, um, but also not forgetting about UVM as an important public institution and, and uh, I would also put a plug in that we want to make sure we don't lose track of our um, independent colleges that are really important in some of our small towns, like mine and Brian's. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, child care, though, is the first one that's really going to hit. And, and there's so much stress and anxiety out there among parents and child care providers about this June 1st deadline and not having sufficient time to prepare or financial resources to do so. Um, and then to be dropped out of the stabilization program without um, any options. Um, I think that we're potentially, you know, leading toward a, a crash of our childcare system if we don't do more to stabilize it beyond June 1st. Um, so there are more details in the list. Um, I don't know if you want me to go through every one of them, but that's the sort of general 
overview. And I also am working, um, as you all know, our education fund is really challenged, shall we say. Um, so I've been working with JFO to try to come up with uh, a plan for that because um, I ha I love education finance issues. So that's, that's something that um, hopefully I can work with the finance committee on too. But Brian, at your suggestion, I just sort of took the flag and ran with it and we'll see what I can come up with. Great, great. Deb? Um, yeah, something else that I think should be on our radar for education um, is uh, yesterday, um, the Tinton County delegation met with um, um, non-tenured, well, tenured and non-tenured faculty at uh, UVM and um, the UVM is attempting to balance its budget by uh, cutting uh, the hours and the pay of non-tenured faculty by 25%. And they're throwing some of them into um, below minimum wage, basically. Um, I mean, they're throwing them into food insecurity and uh, how, I mean, it's, 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 it's very bad, I think, without apparently looking at um, cutting other parts of the university budget, like especially administrative, administrative salaries, which are much higher and could, you know, they could afford to take cuts more easily. So. Uh, I'm going to um, uh, ask Senator Bruce um, to have the Education Committee take some testimony on this, but I, I think it should be on our our radar too. Um, you know, this is not the way we want um, any of our institutions or you know businesses to balance their budgets coming out of this crisis by cutting the you know lower um, level um, and lower and middle salaries and. and creating more hardship on these folks. We need, we, we need to look at the upper levels or using, you know, federal funds or, uh, you know, do anyway, doing a alternative, exploring alternatives. Jeff, did you, uh, did you guys happen to mention what that dollar amount looks like that they're trying to cut? Did that, did they learn that? Um, I can find that out. They they were gonna. That's okay. I I did see the letter from Wendy Koenig. You probably saw that as well. Uh, yeah. And I, I can't remember all the details at that point, but I I have heard that uh, that some. Well, yeah. I guess I'll I'll just keep my mouth shut for now. Thank you. Yeah. yeah they're get, they're yeah they're they're getting us more hard data. Um. So I, yeah, I can have some numbers for us. Anthony? Yeah, I know the answer to this question, but I'd be curious to ask the administration whether they're ever going to consider raising revenue as opposed to just cutting programs. I mean, the word went out that um, agencies are being told to come up with budgets that represent 8% dec declines, I think, in their spending. I'm not sure if the 8% is right. But, you know, sometimes in situations like this, you also have to look at raising revenue. The example would be to rescind the tax cuts that wealthier Vermonters are enjoying now. We talk about a $160 million hole in the education budget. Given the last tax cuts that went into place a year or so ago, um, the wealthiest Vermonters are saving $237 million a year in taxes. So that's money that we could try to recoup some of that and bring that back to the state of Vermont. So the question is whether or not we're ever going to have a conversation about raising revenue, wh where we might find new revenue as opposed to just cuts. I would presume the administration is going to say, no, we're not considering raising revenue, but I think it would be an interesting question to put on the table for them. I mean, there's, there's revenue out there that we're, we're foregoing. The wealthiest 5% are saving $237 million on their taxes now this year, every year, federal taxes. We could put a surcharge on those folks to recoup some of that money that they're, that they're not going to be paying in federal taxes and direct some of that back to the state of Vermont. Yeah, I totally agree with that, Anthony. And, and, and actually, again, I keep having all these other meetings, but um, the Women's Caucus met also on Friday and Stephanie Sweeney um, from uh, UVM um, presented a lot, of, she's an economist and presented a lot of information about how the austerity in a time like this is, is the exact opposite of what we should be doing. And she definitely mentioned, she made a good strong case for exploring raising revenue 
and, and even, uh, you know, and dipping into our reserves and even um, borrowing money if we need to, to have an unbalanced uh, budget because Vermont's one of the few states that doesn't have a balanced budget, um, you know, uh, law. Um, yeah. And I think it's worth, I mean, it's definitely worth hearing. Um, she has a lot of good evidence. Um, and we might want to, we might want to actually invite her to speak to this group. Um, Abby, what's her name again? Stephanie Seguino. It's UVM. U-I-N-O. She's uh, at UVM. I just say to you that um, um, the Appropriations Committee had um, the treasurer speak to us about maybe doing some bonding for housing in a number, um, transportation in those areas to, um, with interest rates low and with all of um, um to take a look at that. And the treasurer came in and was not very, um, uh, was not positive on any of the ideas of boring. She, in fact, she was quite, um, I'm just telling you, but I do, you know, I do think that there is, you know, from transportation, fuel costs are down, um, paving's cheaper, the, um, loan pieces people have a separate uh, bond fund to be able to do that. So it, I, I think at some level in a number of different areas, we, we ought to at least push um, um, people like Tre uh, Treasurer Pierce on that issue. Rich, um, did you have anything in healthcare that you wanted to add to what um, you guys are talking about yet or or human service area, um, um, Debbie, or? We've yet to meet and that's my fault. So we'll try to connect maybe uh, the next okay. couple of days. And All right, we have a long list actually. Yeah. <laughs> or I Good. compiled a long list. For a long, yeah. Yeah. Rich? Yes. Um, Ch Chair Cummings is, and the Finance Committee are of the general opinion that the amount of money we have set aside in rainy day funds is gonna get us through this fiscal year ending at the end of June. And yep. that, 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 that we've been gotten a lot of high marks for our conservative uh, rainy day funds. And, uh, yep. But next year we're on our own. Um, so I, I, Debbie brought that up. And Rich, you brought up the transportation issue. We have a transportation budget that plans to do a certain amount of work this year. And it's yep. clear, I think, to everybody, if we if there are no changes, that work isn't going to get done for right. 2000, for 2021. Um, there are people who are at home not driving. And there are people who drive. There has been suggested that we, if we were, we reacted quickly and put a surcharge on the fuels, motor fuels, whether it was at at wholesale or at the pump for a period of time until our transportation budget was replenished. Only the people who are working and driving would be paying for it. And that we could automatically shut that off when the fund was full or when gasoline went back up to a price around 250, 240, you name the, the dollar figure. But during this time, we should be collecting more money for our transportation fund and as a member of the long-standing member transportation committee is there any right reason why what that shouldn't be one of this committee's recommendations to do that well, immediately well I, I i um mark would say to you that we have um the tib bond fund which is um um that we've never really used as a bond fund um interest rates are low um, and what you're talking about is a lot of the stuff we're going to give up is is construction projects. Yes. And for from in my point of view, um, if we were worried about unemployment, construction jobs are high paying jobs. Yes. And um, you've got interest rates that are as low as they're probably ever going to get. You've got fuel costs that are low in and be paving particularly is something that's based on a petroleum product. Yes. So that's going to be cheap. So you've got the alignment of all of these things. 
and we might be able to borrow some money really cheaply. And because it's a separate bond fund, it not go against the overall bonded indebtedness of the state. Why wouldn't we try to do some of that now? The only reason would be because constantly when we get ourselves into these positions, our solution is always to make our grandchildren pay for it. We've got people that are driving now, earning money. Why don't we have a surcharge to do something tomorrow while we consider the traditional well, way of putting it off? Well, I, I think that's something we need to look at. But what I'm saying is I think um, it might be a combination of both. So... Um, okay. Richie, I, I think, Brian, it's 8.30 yeah. and you need to go. Uh, I think this has been really great. I really, you know, these kinds of deeper di dives, uh, good conversations. Richie and I will work on the list and stay tuned for an invitation uh, from us or from uh, Myra. Yeah, they uh, should look for a doodle poll. And, doodle um, poll, but yeah. Thursday, Thursday, hopefully late in the afternoon, We'll get that presentation from the administration. We will put together some ideas and relay what we said, or what's been said here today. So are and you- And colleagues will also be joining us uh, on that conversation. Alice? So are you thinking that the next meeting of the transitions group won't be until next Thursday? This Thursday. This, oh, yeah, this Thursday. Yeah. Well, and you're saying uh, afternoon? Yes. Afternoon is probably- yes. The best because everybody's the problem. Food. The problem is so many of us have afternoon committees that are meeting. And have you seen the new floor schedule? At it's one o'clock. Yeah. yeah, on Thursday. Right. Yeah. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, Mark, could you hang on? And you, Jimmy, could you hang on for a second? And um, oh, for rain Thursday.